So again, today we're going to be talking about marijuana and CBD law. And so just so people know, we're, we're really going to get more into specific as far as state in, here in the state of Texas and local Harris County, Fort Bend area, because you know a little bit about nat federal, but not too much, but pretty knowledgeable when it comes to state and local, correct? Correct. Okay. So... As it sits right now, currently, explain, give a little background as far as current Texas. Well, is there a big difference between Texas state law and local municipalities and county law? Is there a big difference there, or is it just a difference in how it's enforced? How it's enforced. It's okay. state law rules. There is no municipal laws that relate to marijuana. Okay. It's all state law based. Okay. Um, it's just how each county deals with um the, the charging and punishment of possession of marijuana. Got it. Okay. So the enforcement is the county and local level. That's right. Okay. So current Texas marijuana CBD law, um, wh what is it currently? So marijuana as we know it, green leafy substance, is illegal in the state of Texas. So it's illegal in the state of Texas. It's legal in about 13 states, maybe 12 states for recreational use as well as some states are medicinal use. Mm -hmm. Um, as we sit today, marijuana is legal in Texas. Um, so it's most Ill illegal in Texas, illegal in okay. Texas. All right. Um, so you marijuana, as we think of marijuana and the, the smell that you associate with marijuana, um, that we're, we've, we've known and seen our entire life is, is still illegal in Texas. So anything under two ounces is a class B misdemeanor, a minor, uh, misdemeanor offense, anything between two and four ounces. Uh, is a class A misdemeanor still low level county jail punishment um, and then once you get over four ounces you start getting into felony level um, possession of marijuana that's where you pretty significant amounts up to five pounds is a state jail felony and then you go up to uh, 50 pounds is a third degree then up to 2,000 pounds is a second degree and anything over uh, 2,000 pounds is a first degree felony so you start getting pretty significant punishment ranges when you you know you starting getting truckloads full of marijuana Okay. And at that particular time, it doesn't matter. They don't, they don't classify intent to distribute or anything like that. It's just possession, correct? They don't have intent. So okay. cocaine, methamphetamine, PCP, heroin, all the high level drugs that we think of, there is an intent to distribute mm -hmm. that they could charge you if you have a large amount and say you have scales, you have baggies, um, you have um, large amounts of money with you. They can charge you with possession of methamphetamine with intent to deliver. So methamphetamine is a certain level. If they add the intent to deliver, it bumps it up one um, degree. So it increases the punishment range. Marijuana doesn't have the intent to deliver. They do have delivery. So you can have possession of marijuana. If you have 2,000 pounds, they can't, sh they can't charge you with intent to deliver. But if you are delivering marijuana and they catch you selling it, then they can charge you with delivery, which again ups the punishment range one degree. So it's a little bit different than the possession of meth and cocaine. There is no intent to deliver for marijuana. It's actual possession and or delivery. The intent doesn't matter for marijuana. Okay. Well, that's it. I, I didn't know that. So n no matter what, there's, there's never, unless it's actively, you're actively seen doing it as far as the distribution goes, um, you, with marijuana, even if it's in your possession, like that's all you're getting is a marijuana possession charge. That's right. So if you have a bunch of baggies or it's broken down to 10 little bags, there's no intent to distribute? There is no intent. Wow. Why do you think they do it like that? I think because it's marijuana and it's okay. not what people, you know, our legislators think of as highly addictive um, or drugs associated with um, violence, okay. maybe. I don't know. I don't know. It's been like that since I've been practicing law since so back in 2001, it's always, always been either possession or distribution. There is no intent to deliver marijuana. Wow. I, I, I never knew that. I don't either. That's, that's a, that's. And oddly enough, when you get, we see a lot of cocaine, methamphetamine possession with intent to deliver because of the amount or the baggies or the money. Mm -hmm. We see that all the time charged. I mean, not a lot of times that we plead to it, but it is charged quite a bit. Okay. All right. So what has changed as far as the enforcement goes in relation to marijuana possession here locally, Fort Bend? And when I'm saying locally, Fort Bend, Houston area, Fort yeah, Bend County, County, counties, uh, Sugar Land and Fort Bend, Houston and Harris County. What, what's, what's changed there as far as the enforcement? Yeah, and my question is, so across the state, it's the same law. 
It's just a matter of who is enforcing it and which counties aren't enforcing it. That's right. Okay. And, and it's kind of the policy of the district attorney for that county and how they want to handle um, individuals charged with possession of marijuana. So Harris County, um, the amounts are, I don't know exactly the amounts. I think it's less than two ounces that they write a ticket. That sounds and, right. And it tell you to appear in court. Um, let, let me ask you this real quick, just for people. W sorry to interrupt, but I, when you say two ounces, I know for sometimes people are just like they can't wrap their head around what two ounces. What what would what would two ounces look like? Just basically like one one joint that somebody has. Yeah, that's less than two ounces. You can usually get like a sandwich bag. Okay. Um, it's not stuffed completely full, but most of the time in a sandwich bag, that's uh, typically less than two ounces. Okay. All right. So if you get a gallon size bag you're kind of pushing four ounces you know you're kind of getting in that dangerous territory of getting up to a felony level okay. offense okay all right sorry sorry to interrupt go ahead so you were talking about as far as the enforcement so harris county um da's policy is less than two ounces you write a ticket uh, and then they have the ability to take a class and the case will be dismissed mm -hmm. um, that's the only county that i'm aware of um, surrounding county that does that brazoria county still enforces still arrest Fort Bend County still enforces and still arrests for any amount of um, marijuana. So Harris County is the only one that does that. I know Fort Bend County, with the change in administration, they are going to start implementing a new policy, but it's going to be implemented in court, not, as I know it now, not implemented um, with law enforcement on the scene, only in court where they're giving them an opportunity. If it's a first-time low-level marijuana case to take a class, a drug class, do some um, – maybe some community service in the case gets dismissed. So you're still going to get locked up in Fort Bend even when they enforce that, but in court is when they will lessen the sentence for you? That's correct. So you're going to deal with an arrest record for, you know, a year or two until you get the case dismissed and you can get it expunged. Okay. Are they, how difficult or easy are they making that as far as getting it off your record? It's fairly easy. If you do what you're supposed to do and the case gets dismissed, I've never had a hard time getting expunged off a record. The DA's office has been very um, agreeable to things like that, and, and we file those motions all the time to get these arrest records off the record. Okay. And when it does get expunged, is it truly off your record to where nobody can see it, or is it still visible by people? If you do a good job on the front end, if you find an attorney who knows what they're doing and knows who to serve, 99% of the time you can get it completely wiped off. But you have to serve every single agency who ever touched the case the county clerk, the prosecutor, the sheriff's department, if they made the arrest, um, the FBI because of their database, DPS because of their database. Um, and sometimes you have to serve individual companies who you pay to get criminal history checks done. Like if you go apply for a job, a lot of these employers use a company who does has right. a database and they check criminal records. Right. Well, if their database hasn't been updated, then that record hasn't been wiped clean. So say someone bought a database three years ago when it's, you've been arrested, but in the interim you've had it expunged off your record, they haven't updated their database, mm -hmm. that arrest record is still on their database. And so they report back to the employer, I'm showing an arrest for possession of marijuana. And they ask the kid, have you ever been arrested or charged with marijuana? No, because the kid can legally deny it, it's been expunged, but they haven't updated their database. So sometimes you get in there and if we see those situations occur, then we create we we have a judge sign an order and we serve right. that um, company to take it off their so database it's one thing for the judge to say it will be expunged or fall off your record but it's a whole nother process to actually execute that paperwork to make sure that everybody takes it off absolutely i mean we have to serve every agency some of them now locally to make it easier will allow us to serve them via email so they'll get the judgment um, to expunge the records via an email but if they don't allow service by email we have to um, serve them uh, certified mail return receipt, which the clerk has to send, which can get a little pricey. It's 20, 30 bucks an agency. And you could have 15 to 20 agencies you got to serve to make sure that they get a copy of the judgment and they follow the, the ruling of the court. Okay. Well, that's good to know. That way you just don't automatically assume it's just going to fall off and nobody's no. going to see it. No, you have to, if you don't file a motion to expunge, that arrest record will stay there forever. Wow. Even if the case was dismissed. Okay. It's and, still on your record. And that's dependent upon the counsel that you have and the good work that they do to get that done, right? I mean, you can't just assume that whoever it is that's defending you in that particular case, they're just going to get it done. Right. I mean, you could, you have an attorney and they, they don't do a very good job and they don't serve DPS with the expunction order. Well, everybody gets a criminal history from DPS. 
Mm. Well, it doesn't matter that you serve the clerk or the sheriff's department or district attorney's office and they destroyed the records. The, the main database is DPS. They don't serve DPS. All the other work you've done is worthless. Okay, so that's why you have a good attorney like Smith, McDonald, and Bolin to help you out in that case, correct? <laughs> well, we, we do them all the time, so I, I hope good. we do a good job. That's, that's good. Um, so in the, in the enforcement part of it, is, is it when you're traveling through counties, let's say you're traveling through Harris County, you're traveling through Fort Bend, is, it, is the enforcement of that, like you're in, you're in Fort Bend or you're in Harris County and you're driving in the Fort Bend and you get pulled over less than two ounces of marijuana, I mean, is it, how does that play out? You know, I mean, you're a Harris County resident, you're moving through Fort Bend County. Like, is it, how does, how does that kind of stuff play out? You know, it first starts with how local law enforcement on the scene want to handle it. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about in a podcast, a couple of podcasts ago that, you know, it's a little stronger enforcement now than it used to be with, you know, DWI. Sometimes the officer would take you home or you'd have marijuana. Sometimes they would throw it in the gutter or mm -hmm. flush it down the toilet and they'd let you go. Um, that still happens. Some officers will let you go. If you say you're an 18, 19 year old kid, you're cooperative. You tell them where the marijuana is. It's an extremely small amount. He may just say, look, I'm going to let you go. I'm not going to arrest you for this. Don't do it again. And that's the end of it. And he, mm -hmm. you know, takes the weed and turns it in, but doesn't file charges. Okay. That can happen. I don't know how often that happens because we never see those situations because right. they never come to us. They're never charged, right. but it does happen. Okay. Um, but if you know you come to Fort Bend County and the officer wants to arrest you, then and he's going to arrest you. I mean, there's a difference in Fort Bend and Harris County. Harris County has to give you a ticket. Fort Bend County essentially has to arrest you unless they use their discretion just to completely release you. Okay. And you're saying ticket like you would if you got a speeding ticket, basically. That's right. That's right. Okay. And it gives you time and a place to go in front of a judge and just just like like that. Okay. So in Harris County, when they give you the ticket, do they take your weed? Yes. Yeah, they don't, they don't, yeah, they take the weed. <laughs> I was just asking. Right, well, no, because you're thinking about, I mean, when you get a, I say in reference to a speeding ticket, when you get a speeding ticket, they don't take your car from you. Yeah. So, well, that's, you know, they, they that's and I, I think Harris County is, they give you information where to go take the drug class. Okay. And they give you, say, 60 or 90 days to go take the drug class. Okay. You go take the drug class, you mail them confirmation, you never go to court. Wow. So it's not, I don't think it's technically a ticket. It's a, you need to do this in three months. If you don't do it in three months, then you need to come to court. But if you do it, send us confirmation. We're not going to tie up the court systems with you having to appear. Is how I think it is. Okay. You would think so because I think that's the whole. It's the whole point. Reason that's of right. doing it is to minimize all of the court time. Sure. And all law enforcement's time. Yeah. Having to take all these the, guys all to jail. Of the overhead. So you don't do that. You three months. You go to court. What are you expecting to happen to you when you go into court in a case like that? So you didn't do the the drug class or whatever it was you're supposed to do. So you go in front of a judge in three months. How does how does that look? For the most part, I think they are giving you more time to take the class. Like, hey, dummy, okay. you know, go take the class. You don't want a record. Go okay. take the class. We'll give you another 60 days. Go okay. take the class. Um, is the general census is what they're doing out of, out of Harris County. Okay. Do you think that, we talked about it briefly at the last podcast. Do you think that's happening, that's going to happen here in Fort Bend uh, as far as the same kind of, general enforcement that Harris County has? I don't know if law enforcement is on board with the HPD policy. Um, oh, okay. So I think we're still going to work those cases out in court rather than on the scene with, with tickets and go take a drug class. We're not, we're not there in Fort Bend County at this point. What is it about it that, that you know of at least that, that uh, law enforcement's not, not digging that? Well, I, I, I I think in large part is they don't like someone taking away their discretion and their ability to make arrests when they deem it appropriate. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that is I, I want law enforcement on the scene to have a lot of discretion Sure. because some kids need to go to jail. Some don't. Um, so I don't think we're there yet with taking that discretion away. Um, in large part, you know, you, you, it's hard to go tell Troy Nels, hey, by the way, your officers can't make arrests anymore. I mean, that's a process that's going to take years if it ever happens out here in Fort Bend County. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's a difficult situation that, you know, I don't know of any sheriff who's, who's done such a good job as Troy has that somebody comes in and just says, hey, by the way, we're not going to let you make arrests anymore. I'm not sure that, it, that legally it, anybody can tell law enforcement not to make an arrest for violations of laws in the state of Texas. That's, that's law enforcement's discretion. In Harris County, there's an agreement, 
but I don't think that agreement's coming out here anytime soon. And the agreement is no matter what, if it's a certain, if it's a certain level or a certain size, no arrest at all, ticket and they go on their way. That's right. And Fort Bend, you have anything, you're getting locked up and they'll work it out in court. Correct. Okay. Which and it's, you know, I, I can see both sides of it. I can see the saving of the time and overhead and money and not making the arrest. But I can also see the kid getting arrested and having to come to court that that's going to have a much more dramatic impact on an 18 year old kid than him being detained on a scene for 15 minutes and he has to go take a class online and that's it. That's the only accountability that he has. I think having to come to court, seeing that this is serious, going to jail, being booked in, being around some of these guys in jail will much have a much more sure. dramatic impact in trying to get him off that Scared route. That he's on. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's something to be said for that. Yeah. I, I can see how enforcement, law enforcement at least, taking that responsibility out of their hands and not letting them. I, I'm sure they can have some discretion as far as if something looks fishy, right? You know, like if you have somebody that's got a small, small, uh, a small amount with them, but something doesn't look right. I mean, they can pursue the steps from that, right? Or do they get to a point where somebody can come back and say, he only had a small amount. They had no right to further the, the investigation, I guess, on the scene. I don't think they're there. I believe if, if you have the marijuana or you, they smell the marijuana, they still have the right to search um, the car to see how much marijuana you have, see if you have other narcotics, stolen weapons, anything else, burglary tools, um, you know, things like that in the vehicle. I don't, I don't believe they're, the rules in Harris County preclude law enforcement from continuing their investigation until they're satisfied. That okay. they've, they've done what they need to. What actually constitute them being able to search your car? The short I, answer you know, is smell of weed. They so smell weed. Probable cause. Probable smell cause of weed. to search your car. That's it. And it, that's a smell of weed. And okay. that's, and you know, we have a difficult time with that because again, we don't know the statistics on how many times law enforcement says they smell weed and they don't find it. And we have no way to refute that they smelled weed or didn't smell weed. It's very subjective. Sure. You can't fight that in court other than, the officer's lying, and I'm yeah. not ever doing that unless I have some evidence to support it. Right. So all we see is officer says, I smell weed, I'm searching your car, when he finds weed. It's hard for us to get into court and say, well, the officer made that up. He, no way he could smell the weed when he found the weed in the car. It's right. Just, you know, you're kind of in a, a catch-22. Well, and sometimes they say that they bring the dog out to sniff the car, and if the dog marks it, then that's probable cause to search. Absolutely. And okay. there's, you know, there's some timelines in recent case law, not recent, last few years about times they can detain you to bring the drug dog around and do they need reasonable additional reasonable suspicion other than the traffic stop to further detain you to wait for the dog um, so we see that we don't see a lot of dog searches out here but we see you know a fair amount well and i just want the people that are the audience that are watching to know you know actually what that law is or what to expect they bring a drug dog out if, if they they typically ask for consent if you refuse consent they're going to talk to you they're going to try to establish some additional reasonable suspicion and then they're going to wait for the dog or bring their dog out and walk it around the car. Uh, and if the dog alerts, it's probable cause to search. Sure. And a lot of times they do that while they're investigating the traffic offense, especially if the dog's in the stopping officer's car. As long as he's still investigating the traffic offense, he has a right to walk the dog around the car. And dog alerts are going to pull you out and search your car. From your position, what do you, if somebody has, whether it's a small weed, big amount, small amount, what should they do in response when the officer asks, do you have marijuana in the car? always deny always it's never i've never seen it benefit strike that i've seen it benefit my clients and i make the argument when they do cooperate and they do give consent or like hey i got some weed in my pocket i have seen them get a benefit for that in court i'll go talk to the prosecutor I'm like look he's an 18 year old kid he told the cops where the weed was he handed it to him he didn't play any games he was up front he was honest i've used that countless times and i believe it has helped my client but i do i think that benefit is worth allowing officers to search your car no i don't um, the officer asks to search your car you, you no my attorney advised me not to let you search my car i have a right to refuse um, if you have probable cause to search my car you know you can search my car and that's i train law enforcement that way i'm like always ask for consent even if you see a dead body in the back seat that gives you probable cause to search the car go ask hey do you mind if i search your car if they say yes well now you have consent we can't argue that you didn't have probable cause, you couldn't really see the dead body in the car or the brick of cocaine in the back seat. Mm -hmm. So always go ask. 
always told law enforcement. They always struggle with that. Ask for consent. They give you consent. There's nothing that defense attorney can ever argue in court. Mm -hmm. You're on consent on video, giving them the right to search your car. If you don't ask them for consent and you just go ahead and search and you find a brick of cocaine, first thing I'm going to do is follow a motion to suppress it. You could not know from your vantage point that that was a brick of cocaine. You saw a white substance that looked like a brick, but you don't know what that was. No, I don't know what that was. I thought it was cocaine from my training experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm fighting that in court. I'm fighting that search. So if they get into the vehicle without probable cause or without your consent and they find something in the trunk, are you able to get that dismissed out of court because they didn't go through the proper legal procedures to search your vehicle? Yes. Yes. All the, not all the time. It happens. You know, officers are very well trained now. They know. And it's nine times out of ten, it's a smell of marijuana. Mm -hmm. That's what we typically see is a smell of marijuana or search warrants. And we can't do much with search warrants because it's confidential informants. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, sure. do they have enough probable cause in the, in the search warrant to, to search your house? And, so in reality, like you said, you don't really have a gauge of exactly, I, I, you know, you always want to give people the benefit of the doubt that they're going to do what they need to do. But in reality, a cop would come up and say, even though he doesn't, and say, I smell, I, if he thinks there could be something in there and says, I smell marijuana, do you give me permission to search a car? And somebody says, yes, and you search a car and you find some stuff like you can't gauge on that and say, well, he didn't really smell that, right? That's what you were saying earlier. That's right. I mean, okay. if, he, if, he, if he smells weed and... Or thinks he does. That's right. And he says, hey, I smell weed. Do you mind if I look in your car? Rather than, hey, I smell weed. Get out. I'm searching your car. So well, if, then, if you have that situation where they say, I think I do. Can I search your car? At that point, you can accept or deny and he can't move forward? If he says he smells it, he can move forward. If he asks you, if he says, I smell weed, can I search your car? He's doing a good job okay. because he's protecting himself. He's not going to force us to, he's not going to rely upon the smell of weed alone. Okay. If he gets your consent, well, he gets your consent and I can't fight. You didn't really smell the weed. Then it takes out us doing a background investigation, pulling the statistics. How many times has he said he smelled weed and searched a car mm. and didn't find weed? Has mm. he done it 150 times and he's found weed 20 times? Well, if I can pull those records and find that out, that's extremely beneficial to my client. Sure. And then I can fight that, well, you didn't really smell weed. But if he gets consent, it takes my, all my power away. Okay. Because my guy said, you can look. I can't argue with that. It's on audio and videotape. Right. If he says, if, if, you, if he walks up and says, I smell marijuana, can I search your vehicle? And you say no. Can you say no? And he doesn't, like, but he's just asking basically at that point just to make sure that procedural part of it is checked off. He, he can do it no matter what. If he smells it, he's just making sure that's checked off, right? That's right. He's being smart. Okay. He's protecting himself and protecting the case in court. All right. So if he smells it, he's just, you're SOL. That's he's going to exactly look right. in there. You're okay. exactly and right. are all officers uh, wired up with mics and cameras now? For the most part. And you'll, you'll see some malfunctioning cameras, some batteries that go dead, and malfunctioning mics. It happens. It's getting more infrequent than it used to. Um, but it still does happen on occasion. Do you find that, that you're able to access that footage pretty easily through the court systems? Oh, or yeah. to they got to turn it over. They have to turn it over. Um, what we call the Michael Morton Act or 3914, the Code of Criminal Procedure. They have to turn over fence reports, videos, statements, written statements, everything. They have to turn over to us now. So we get copies of everything within. If it's a felony, once they're indicted, we get copies of everything, which usually happens within... I don't know, a month of them getting indicted. We got copies of everything. And cool. most, of, most of the prosecutors I'm, you know, I have a good relationship with them. I can call them and I'm like, hey, if you watch this video, tell me what it's about. And 99% of the time they're like, either I've watched it and yes, this is what it's about. Or, hey, give me a few days. Let me look at it and let me see. Because I'm like, I have some concerns. And my guy told me this. Can you look at the video real quick um, before you go to grand jury and just make sure that everything looks okay? And almost all of them will, will say, oh, okay, yeah, I'll take a look at it. Well, those videos got to be really helpful to either... You know, in the case one way or another, real quick, whether it's in your defense or theirs, it's yeah, going it, it, to shut shit down real quick. Absolutely. I tell my clients, and I'm like, well, once I look at your video, I'll tell you exactly what I think is going to happen. And I'm <laughs> almost sure. always right. I know it, if I can get you out of it, and I know what your punishment's probably going to be based on your criminal history. Yeah. I mean, I can come within, you know, days or months of your probation or your jail time, or if I can get you out of it. Yeah. And a lot of times, if I can get you out of it, I don't have to go through those steps because the prosecutor is going to have the same opinion and we'll reach an agreement. 
It's like, yeah, I mean, I, look, I know that was a legal search. You know, I'll go ahead and kick the case. Or, yeah, that was a close call for me. I'll go ahead and reduce this second degree felony to a misdemeanor time served. So most of the time they're, you know, especially Fort Bend County, which is, I'm the most familiar with, they are, if it's a bad search or it's a questionable call, most of the time they're well above board, almost every time, or well above board, at least with me, and, and I'm reaching an agreement so we don't have to jump through all those hoops. Okay, so to, to end this, uh, to end this discussion as far as marijuana goes, what should somebody do in possession and they're pulled over by a police officer? First and foremost, be respectful. Okay. You know, I, we see a lot of individuals who just don't have any respect for law enforcement, and it typically goes terribly wrong when that happens. So first and foremost, be respectful. Um, make sure your hands are visible. I, I'm an advocate of when officers walk up, I don't believe officers like you digging for your license and your, your insurance as they're walking up. I think they want to make sure that you're not digging for anything, your hands are on the wheel. If they ask for consent, always refuse. Always refuse consent. Do not ever allow a law for, and be respectful. Say, look, you know, I understand you're trying to do your job. Um, my attorneys advise me not to allow you to search my vehicle. Um, I, if you're gonna search it, I'm gonna cooperate. Uh, I'm sorry I can't give you consent, but I, I'm just relying on advice of my attorney and, and I hope I'm not, uh, you, don't, you don't feel I'm being disrespectful. Be kind, be nice, you know, because at some point a jury, if we go to trial, is gonna see your attitude. And if you want a jury to find you not guilty, they, they, want, they, they, they need to like you. You need to be a, a nice guy. If you're a total jerk and cussing officers out, Nobody in that jury is going to be rooting for you. So be nice, be respectful, um, understand law enforcement's trying to do their job and what law enforcement asks you to do, you cooperate. Um, absent, let him to search your car with consent. And so most of these cases or these instances that if you do get caught, you do get locked up, you go to jail, you have to fight in court, there's always going to be video and audio provided that's going to help your defense or go against you vast majority of times. I mean, we see some malfunctions, but other than the malfunctions, by large part, I, I, I audio and video is going to be there. Every single agency so has it now. Kill them with kindness, politely decline, and you'll get to use that footage to also help back you in court. Absolutely. Which I mean, could play into your favor. You're not going to win that fight on the scene. Never. Are you going to win the fight by being an asshole to, to law enforcement? You're just not. Sure. Um, they're not going to be like, Oh, you're a jerk. I'm gonna let you go. Yeah, man. It's common sense. Right. So, be polite, be kind. They're trying to do a job. They're not out to get you, you know, and cooperate the best you can without giving consent. Cool. Okay. Well, be nice to the cops out there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I always get surprised whenever I see people and they yell and holler and scream. And, and I just, I don't know, like you said, I think that was funny when you said they're not going to go, oh, okay, well you're right. I'm going to go ahead and leave you alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I think law enforcement's yeah. going to work harder to try to find um, a violation of the law than if you were polite and kind and nice. Sure. So, you know, and, that, and that's what I, I learned too, or at least I heard is don't make their stop rem uh, memorable. Like if you're, if it's very boring and very bland and you said, yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Here's this, here's that. Okay. You know, whatever it's, it's not as memorable a stop, I guess. And it's, it's, that's the first thing I tell prosecutor. If my client is extremely nice and courteous and respectful, like we talked about, that's the first thing I say is like, hey, if you watch this video, my client is really respectful. He's really kind. You know, no, he didn't give consent and they smelled weed and they found it anyway. But, you know, I, that, that, that's something to his benefit. Is that something I'm going to argue for him? It's like, hey, cut this kid a break. You can see his attitude. He's got a good attitude. He's a good kid. He just had some weed. Rather than, oh, man, don't watch that video. My client is a jerk. I, you know, what do we want me to say? Right. Okay. Makes my job much easier. All right. Well, good. Um, so I, I guess when we... When I opened this up, I said we're going to be talking about marijuana and CBD laws. So I, I guess that's kind of the vogue thing now, I guess, uh, when it comes to this is CBD. And so we can get into the questions and be specific, but what is CBD? What are the laws for that? And what do people need to be aware of when it comes to their possession of that? So we're seeing these oils um, when it comes to vaping. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part here, and then we're seeing a lot of edibles. So there's two different types of oil. There's CBD oil, which is legal, which you can see in some of these smoke shops. You can find in the stores that are marketed and packaged professionally and sold in large stores, box stores that are labeled CBD oil. Mm -hmm. For the most part, almost every single case, that contains no 
THC. Yes. It's completely legal. On the other hand, you have THC oil, which is a non-plant-based oil. It's not a green leafy substance. It's plant-based because it's an oil from marijuana plant. But it's charged differently because it's not a green leafy substance anymore. Even though it's the same active ingredient of THC, it's an oil. It's not a green leafy substance. So instead of misdemeanor amounts like you have a marijuana, it automatically, any amount, is a felony. So you, the problem you're running into is these kids are getting what they believe is CBD oil that's been brought in from Colorado, from Oregon, from Washington, and they believe it's CBD oil, and it comes back containing THC. Well, now all of a sudden, they're charged with a felony. And a lot of times they know. It's like, hey, this came, this is some THC oil. But sometimes they don't. They think it's CBD oil, and it's, in fact, THC oil. They get popped for a felony. And you're seeing that a lot, a lot with the high school kids, um, 19, 20, 21-year-olds, that are um, thinking they have CBD oil, and, in fact, it's THC, and now they have a felony arrest record. Um, you know, Fort Bend County has been really good with reducing those to misdemeanors because I think it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a change in the law that I believe is coming through the legislature that it needs to be chained, uh, charged similarly to possession of marijuana because it's the same active ingredient. Mm -hmm. Same thing with edibles. You bring in edibles from Colorado, Washington, Oregon, that's oil. That's THC oil. It's automatically a felony, even though it's, a say, a Skittle-sized um, edible of THC. It's a felony. It has the same effect as marijuana. Um, it, it affects you a little differently because the way it's digested, but um, we're seeing that a lot, and it's it, 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 these kids are getting felony arrest records, and it's you know, because they don't, they don't know the difference between a THC and a CBD oil. And you can't tell by looking at it. And you, unless you're around it a lot, um, I talked to a law enforcement officer today, and he's like, I can smell the difference, but it's very, very, very distinct between CBD oil and THC oil. It's, very, it, it, it's not very distinct. Sorry, let me back up. It's, it's very subtle, and it dissipates quickly. He goes, I can tell the difference. He said, but the average person has no idea that it's THC oil as compared to CBD oil. Does law enforcement have a way to test different oils on scene? They do the same presumptive test that they have, and sometimes the CBD oil will test positive for THC. The lab will come back that it's negative, or vice versa. That it'll test negative for THC, but they send it to the lab and it comes back positive. So I think law enforcement is um, trying to be very cautious with these presumptive tests on the scene because they are getting false positives and vice versa. They're getting some to test negative and come back that it is containing THC and then file on the, on the individual later. So what is the difference right now? Cause I've heard there's CBD with no THC and I also heard about Trump passing some laws or what have you that is going to allow CBD oil to have up to 3% THC. And I've even seen it where some of the local CBD stores are, straight up marketing our cbd has up to three percent thc in it here locally so is that legal or illegal any amount of thc 0. 0.0001 is illegal so if it is marketed cbd with thc that is illegal so now if trump if, if federally if they pass a law that goes to federal law <clears throat> that doesn't change state law so the feds can say marijuana is legal Texas has to say marijuana is legal. So we enforce state laws. DEA enforces federal laws. So a lot of these states where marijuana is legal, it's still illegal federally. But the feds are choosing not to enforce that law and, and allowing states to um, regulate the use of marijuana in their state. So anybody, and, and I know a few people, I know a couple guys that have opened up some CD, CBD locations here. I know a girl that sells it um, online or through some multi-level marketing thing, any, and for their sake, if they're listening, if they are marketing CBD that has THC in it, they are breaking a law if they're here in Texas, not marketing it. They can market it all they want. If they're selling it or if they have it in their possession, you are seeing some people market CBD with THC because it is much more effective because THC is the psychoactive ingredient that gives you that high. CBD is mostly for medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. It treats sure. you know, anxiety, PTSD. They're seeing a lot of great information coming out for, for PTSD in, in vets. But the THC is the active ingredient that gives you that psychosis. So a lot of people market CBD with THC because that's what people want. 
but it doesn't contain any THC. So right now, the ones that are saying it's CBD oil, but it has up to three or, and I don't know why the number is 3%, but they all just happen to say 3% THC in it. So if in fact that product has 3% or any percent of THC, then they are breaking a law and it's a felony. They can be charged with delivery of a controlled substance. Yes. Or if they have a local store here and they are selling it on their shelves, then they are facing. They could be charged with delivery of a controlled substance. Okay. Yep. That's, I would be, if in fact that's happening, I would advise them to take that off their shelves and <laughs> destroy it immediately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, has it happened? Absolutely. I mean, I don't, law enforcement is may not have caught up with it. And it's it not like they're trying to sell marijuana or weed and break the law. They're right. selling creams and topicals and eye cream and, you know, stuff that's curing cancer. I get all that. But I think that a lot of people assume because Trump basically said he's not going to enforce it on a federal level that it's okay to start selling it in Texas because it has 3% and Trump said it's okay. But yep. actuality is that's a felony. You'll get locked up and you'll be charged with possession of a controlled substance. That's right. And that's a felony. That's right. Okay. And, uh, you know, the officer I talked to today um, it was saying that every every place we've seen selling CBD oil is legitimate CBD oil without any traces of THC. Um, what I have kind of been told and seen is you never can guarantee that CBD oil doesn't have traces of THC in it because it comes from hemp. And you have to be very careful in how you process it. So you got to get it from a reputable dealer. But again, if it's packaged, the ingredients are on it, then these big companies can't be manufacturing and sending products to a state where it's illegal because they're breaking the law. So they do a very good job in making sure there is no THC in their CBD oil. Now, if you're buying CBD oil on the street corner, there's no telling what you're getting. Sure. Um, but if you buy it from a reputable location, and he even mentioned... Um, Smoke shops. He says they're selling CBD oil, but every occasion we've seen it marketed in a reputable dealer, it is CBD oil, no THC in it, the times that we've tested it. So when you have this happen, officer feels like that somebody's in possession of that. They stop. There's a, most of what it sounds like is there's no way that they could know 100% that what they have in their possession is THC immediately like it sounds like something that has to go to a lab and like something that you would know later on correct correct okay i mean unless it's an extremely experienced law enforcement officer and they can tell that very subtle distinction in the smell i haven't seen anybody testify to that that i'm aware of i don't know if it's occurred um but that would be i think a very fine line but i've been told by someone i find to be extremely reputable that he can distinguish between a CBD and a THC oil that's been vaped. So if a cop pulls you over and you have CBD or THC oil on you, can the cop then test it and take you in if it tests positive for THC? He can. I think they're being very careful about doing that because of the false positives. I mean, and that's why it's a, I guess it's fairly new product. It is. It's not, you know, we marijuana joints, blunts, whatever. It is something kind of new to market. So they're kind of holding back a little bit on that. I think so. I mean, in, in large part, my experience with law enforcement is they don't want to put anybody in jail for something that it may could, because it's a hassle to get that taken off your record that, okay, look, it is showing positive for THC, but I know we've had some labs where it comes back and it's not mm -hmm. THC, but mm -hmm. we arrested the person and now we've got a, he's bonded out. He spent money on an attorney and, and we just dismissed the charges we don't necessarily think that's fair. So I think law enforcement is very cognizant of let's try to give some of these folks the benefit of the doubt and, and not put them in custody for a felony and spend all this money when we know sometimes it is coming back as not being positive. What would you advise a client that has THC oil on them and they know it's THC oil and they get pulled over and the officer asks if they have any marijuana in the car? What should that person say? You... It applies to on the scene, to at the jail, to, you know, talking to law enforcement. You never, ever, ever confess to committing an offense. Okay. Because I, it, once you confess, the avenues that I have to help you are extremely limited from that point forward. So my advice always has been, look, I want to cooperate. I don't mind talking to you. Um, I know you have some questions. Um, my attorney advised me not to not speak to you without him being present. I would love to, to talk with you later, as long as my attorney can be present, if you're okay with that. 
Okay. That makes sense to people. Sure. Like my attorney advised me not to talk. I'm, I'm not going to talk without him being present. Be polite, be respectful. And law enforcement respects that. Mm-hmm. I mean, they know law enforcement, if they get pulled over, do you think law enforcement's going to tell the officer who pulled them over? Yeah, man, I got a pound of weed in the trunk of my car, man. I'm sorry. Of course they're not. Right. They're going to say, no, I, I, I'm not comfortable with you searching my car. I'd like my attorney being present. They get it. You know, they deal with it every day. Okay. I guess in relation to the CBD and the THC, what about if you're somebody that doesn't have, I guess, the same thing, I guess. If you have CBD and it's not THC, but you really don't know if there's anything in it or not, the same, same, same criteria apply there? If, it's, if you think it's CBD and it's supposed to be CBD, but it, you, you don't know that for 100%, you're kind of questioning, same procedure then? I agree, yeah, same okay. procedure. I mean, you could say... Eh. I think if you can show you bought CBD oil from a reputable dealer, let's just say CVS for argument's sake, you, and you have the package and it says CBD and you have the receipt from CVS and it comes back that it's THC from the lab, I would be really surprised if they prosecuted you for that offense. They may arrest you. You may have to go to court, but if I present that evidence to um, a prosecutor, I think they would be hard-pressed to prosecute you for that offense. Okay. Um, same thing we see with prescription drugs. You have prescription drugs, you don't have the bottle. You bring the bottle later showing you did have a prescription. It's the exact same pills you had in your possession. They dismiss those cases. I think if, if you have a good faith reliance, they don't have to dismiss it, but for the most part, I think they would. Okay. Is it true that it's getting a little bit more lenient, I guess, in the state of Texas when it comes to medical marijuana and, I guess, possession? I, I've read that recently within the last year or two they've started to grant um licenses to to companies that are wanting to do medical marijuana here in the state of texas is that is that accurate i think it's coming that way i don't know if we have i think we have some medical marijuana um, laws in place here i don't know because i never see it okay so i never see a medical marijuana case come my way because it's if they have it and it's it's with a prescription then, but I don't, I don't think we, let me back up. I don't think we have medical marijuana in Texas. Okay. I really don't. Okay. I think it's heading that way right. just because of the studies that are coming out with PTSD and, right. and um, anxiety and pain relief. And you know, right. it's a whole list of things. Okay. It's going that way, but I'm not sure Texas has that yet. Well, okay. I think it should. I think Texas will be one of the last states to pass it, but <laughs> I, I do too. I definitely think it should go in that way because I've I do heard too. many, many stories of how it's helped people. And, and who knows, maybe it was fake news. But I, I, <laughs> I, felt like, I felt like I read that at some point that at least Texas was starting, I think it was like three companies starting to grant medical license for them to produce or sell. And so that's, that's, that's why I said that question. Gotcha. One of the questions that I have, uh, could be a multi-part question, right. is related to punishment related. You know, I think people out there that are smoking weed um, you know, what type of punishments are involved with the different classes, whether it's a misdemeanor, it's a felony one, felony two. Earlier you were talking about the different quantities right. and what type of level they were at. So what are the punishments associated with that? And if you do get punished with that, what type of legal fees would we be looking at? We <laughs> <laughs> saying we the people. Yeah, I we personally, the- I don't like weed and I don't smoke weed. Uh, but what type of penalties would the people be looking at, uh, as well as, you know, what type of cost associated with hiring an attorney to represent them? A good attorney. Gotcha. So if you have the, minor, the lowest amount, less than two ounces, um, for the most part now with the change in administration, I think we're going to start seeing you take a drug class. We're going to dismiss your case. So the lowest level offense of marijuana, if you don't have any priors, um, we're going we're gonna to send you to a drug class. You can learn about the dangers of marijuana, that it's not just, you know, some, 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 some drug to play with, that it can have some dramatic effects on your life. We'll dismiss the case. I think that's going to change the fee schedule in Fort Bend County a bit because that wasn't available before, that, that you go take a drug class, we'll dismiss. Mm-hmm. So that'll, I think, decrease the, at least the low-level possession of marijuana fees. Um, typically for our firm, or a good attorney, not necessarily our firm. We, we are charged more on the higher end just because we're board certified or on board certified in criminal law. But you're looking at lowest level offense, 2,500 bucks. Um, once you get to a class A misdemeanor, maybe 3,000 to 5,000. Once you get in the felony range, you're looking at, you know, state jail third, maybe five to 10,000. 
then when you start getting a second, first degree, you could be tens of thousands of dollars, depending on your criminal history, depending on, you know, if, if we have um, an unlawful stop, an unlawful search that we have to litigate in court, and how much you have to lose. I mean, if you're a two-time convicted felon and you're 25 to life, well, my fee is substantially higher for you because you're probably not going to take their 20, 25-year offer. We're going to have to go to trial and try to beat it. And then you get into trial fees um, that we charge uh, separate and apart from the typical attorney fee as trying to work the case out. So you'll see a little bit of change in, in what we charge. I think that $2,500 for low-level offenses will decrease um, a bit because it's not much work to come in and they're guaranteed essentially to take a drug class and the case will get dismissed. We don't have to do much work on those cases. Um, but once you get to class A and felony levels, I think we'll, we'll play pretty consistent. With and class A is how much? Two to four ounces. Okay. So basically, <laughs> if, you're, if you have less than two ounces on you, you're going to spend a couple grand to get out of trouble. I think that's a fair bet. And if you're going to have more than two ounces, then pr be prepared to spend a lot of money. And it's weight-wise, a good perspective is your tennis shoe probably weighs about 10 ounces. So cut it in half, roughly. And okay. that's, about, that's about your felony level. If your weed weighs about what half your tennis shoe does, you're walking a fine line with being a felony amount of weed. Okay. So that's a good kind of rule of thumb. Okay. You, with what's going on with Harris County in relation to the... Go ahead. I actually want to do it on the sandwich bag. Okay. <laughs> Basically, if you've got a sandwich bag full of weed, you're going to get in some trouble. It's going to be expensive. If it's about halfway full... Because you can typically fit how many ounces in a bag? Because people aren't weighing shoes, and I'm just for the people, that, the audience that's watching. Probably two to three ounces. Two to three ounces in a sandwich bag. Yeah. So keep your sandwich bag under halfway full, and it won't be too expensive that's for That's right. You. Okay. That's right. Cool. That's good. No, I, I like that. That's, you know, yeah. wanted to give the people out there, keep it, sandwich bag, halfway <laughs> full, you'll be all right. <laughs> but, but when you're talking about what Harris County is doing in relation to the ticket and, and that, that's that's for the first time. I mean, if in six months after you're found again, I mean, then then it moves beyond that, right? I mean, this isn't a every time you get get found you get found with less than two, it's going to be that. I mean, it's it's going to pile up on you, correct? I don't know that to be true. I th I I think they're giving multi uh, multi time offenders additional chances when they get caught. Okay. With the low level marijuana okay. cases, Harris County don't care. Have less than two weeds in Harris County. You get a ticket, you pay a fine, you move on. You don't have to worry about it. Okay. And right. I think Harris County, it's just the system gets overwhelmed at times with oh, low yeah. level drug offenses. Imagine. And, yeah. you know, especially when it's legal, people are kind of starting to veer towards a let's not spend all resources on those marijuana cases. So, I mean, I understand it in part. I don't agree with it, but I understand it. Okay. So you are found to be in possession, and it's pretty high level as far as the amount that you have. Um, he was asking as far as punishments go. I mean, what when, when you're trying a case or you're helping somebody to try to get out of it and they made a really bad, stupid mistake, I mean, what, what typically are you looking at as far as what people are needing to do or, or what's the expected of them to help reduce their punishment, to um, remove it completely? Like, what, 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 can you, what can people do if you ever get just that bad of a luck and you have that situation happen to you to try to help you get out of something like that? So we, I think we're a little different than most firms is we try to be extremely proactive from the front end. So we okay. spend a lot of time from the front end with our clients and trying to mitigate the damage that they're going to see in a couple months when they come to court. First mm -hmm. and foremost is stop smoking weed. <laughs> yeah. If you're arrested for weed, stop smoking. That's yeah. what we all want. That's what a prosecutor wants to see is, okay, you got arrested for weed. You made a mistake. Let's learn from that mistake. Let's make sure you're clean. Okay. Stop smoking weed. Mm -hmm. We're going to send you for drug tests and they're going to be random. I'm mm -hmm. not going to tell you when I'm going to drug test you. I'm going to, I'm going to call you and say, you need to get a drug test within 24 hours. Okay. Some clients like it. Some don't, don't hire me, but that's part of the deal is if you want me to help you, you have to cooperate and do what we tell you. Go get a drug test. Let's have eight or 10 drug tests before we go to court to show you're clean. You know, you made a mistake. You want to do the right thing. Uh, if you have a drug problem, we'll get you into treatment. You know, if you got a weed problem, you can't quit on your own. Let's be proactive. Let, rather than I have four drug tests and we're reacting to that. Because then the prosecutor's like, well, he had a chance to go to drug treatment, but now it's taken four positive drug tests and now he wants to go to treatment to try to mm -hmm. stay out of trouble. Right. Let's be proactive. Tell me if you have a problem. 
I'll give you a couple of drug tests. If you can stay clean, then you don't have a problem. If you can't stay clean, let's send you to treatment. So mm. we're proactive in that approach is we need to send you to treatment. Let's get you there. And then it is just start gathering information to show me who you are. Okay. I want your resume. I want your high school grades. I want your middle school grades, your junior high grades. I want to know volunteer activity. I want to know if you have any extracurricular activities that you participate in. Are you a member of your church? What have you done for your church? Who's your family? I want to know all of those things because like we talked about um, last episode with Amanda and Phoebe, everybody has a story. I want to be able to tell that story and I can't tell that story by talking to you for 30 minutes. I need material I can look at and I can pick and choose what I think is a benefit to you and present that to the prosecutor. Mm, And we see that a lot when we try to get pretrial diversions where it's a kind of a contract with the state of Texas and you jump through some hoops and your case gets dismissed rather than it being an official court process. Okay. Um, and I think it'll be much more prevalent now that we have a new administration as well. So okay. it's, we're very proactive and uh, upfront with our clients when it, when it comes to those cases. And that's that in the end pays off, but okay. it's a lot of work for us up front. Do you have any other questions that you wanted to hit on? Uh, the only other thing that I think was uh, related to home searching, we talked about probable cause and searching cars. Uh, when, officers come to your house um whether you know it's a party you're loud the neighbors call the cops uh, whether it's my kids uh, some are under the age of 18 some are in their 20s uh what is the law whether i'm home or not and or not um as far as them being able to enter your property what is probable cause what gives officers uh permission or green light to enter your home without a warrant okay so they can search your car without a warrant because what we call an automobile exception. It's a movable vehicle. So they can search it without a warrant. Your house is not, it's not movable. You don't get the automobile exception. Law enforcement must have a warrant to search your home. There's some exceptions, but by and large, they must have a warrant. So if I'm out front smoking a joint, they pull up, they see the weed, they cannot search my house. In that circumstance, unless you tell them I got the weed from inside the house, they can't search your house. Okay. So if what happens and what, the, what law enforcement can do is they come up to your door and they knock on your door. You open the door, they smell weed. That is probable cause. What the courts have held is they can come in your house, they can detain everybody in your house, and at that point they can't search, but they can detain everybody to prevent anybody from destroying evidence. They then go get a warrant from a magistrate. They come back with that warrant, they search your house, recover the marijuana. Um, so they, ju- they have to have probable cause to search your house. They have to have a warrant to search your house. They have to have probable cause sorry, to, to, okay, to, enter to, to enter and detain everybody inside of it. And what, sometimes they'll make and a protective they, sweep. And if they enter it and see a pound of weed on the table. They're going to get a warrant okay. to get your weed. Gotcha. I mean, there's some exigent circumstances that they can search your house. And, you know, but by and large, they need a warrant. If they, you know, they see the weed, they smell the weed, underage drinking, same thing. They can come in and detain everybody and um, get a warrant to try to find alcohol because there's underage drinking, a violation of the law. Okay. So, and, you know, if, if you're smoking weed and you're having a party in the house, don't answer the door. Yeah. They can't come in if they don't, unless they have a warrant. But if you're smoking out back, there's nothing they can do about it. Unless they smell it. Well, if they smell it out back, is that considered in your house or is that in the backyard? Therefore, they can, they that can't gives enter. them probable cause to detain you and investigate. As well as walk in through your back door if they want. They have to have probable cause the weed's inside the house. Okay. To come in your house. So okay. if you're on the back porch, I think it would be difficult for them to show that there's weed in the house unless someone says, oh, man, our stash is in the bedroom closet. <laughs> so, again, don't talk. Yeah. And they won't get in your house. Okay. I mean, I think there, there may be some circumstances where you have extremely educated and experienced law enforcement officer that they could try to, 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 to show that if they find somebody smoking weed at the back door based on my training experience, I've always found weed to be present in the house because that's where they store it. and It's dry and climate controlled. You may be able to get there. I haven't seen it, but it's an argument I think they could make. Well, and going back to the underage drinking, if I am home and I have a 18-year-old or a 20-year-old, anybody under 21, and I want to allow them to drink and they are drunk and the cops come to the door and he's drunk and he's 18 and he opens the door, even though I'm allowing him to drink, are the cops able to enter the residence for a probable cause? Is it your child? Yes. I think they can investigate if that's your child. 
I'm not sure they can come in. That's getting tricky. That's a gotcha. that's an interesting kind of a what we call a law school question. That's interesting. Um, I think they can investigate to see if he's your child. Um, if it's somebody else's child. Now, having said that, if they the 18 year old answers the door and the cops are like, "Hey, step out here," or "Do you mind stepping out?" They ask the question rather than ordering. "Do you mind stepping out?" And the kid steps on the front porch. That's public intoxication. Mm. If he crosses the threshold of the house, that becomes public. And so you'll see that a lot. That's a trick law enforcement does is you're being a jerk at the door. You're drunk, but they can't, nothing they can do. You have a right to be drinking inside your house. It's like, hey, man, look, you're not in any trouble. Do you mind coming out the front yard and talking to us real quick? We, we know we saw a problem down the street, and we need to, to see if you know anything about it. Oh, absolutely. I'll come out. All right, put your hands behind your back. Now it's public intoxication. long as they ask the question and it's not ordering you outside. I have been arrested for that before. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> what we call a PIP it's or bullshit. POP, piss off police. Yeah. You're going to go to jail. Yeah. Okay. That's probably a good story, I bet. I bet it is. <laughs> I bet that's I'm reading between story. the lines. That's right. I bet it is. Yeah. Well, I, I think we've, uh, we've covered a lot. I, think, I, I hope we answer a lot of questions uh, when it comes to marijuana and CBD, possession, punishment, cost all that, uh, you know, I, I think it's been very valuable, the information. I know I've learned a lot as yeah, far as in the absolutely in the hour, you know, that we've been sitting here oh, good. talking about it. So uh, what we want to do at the end of every show, because just sitting here talking to you, just whenever it's the show's on, on and we're just we're just talking, you, you have a lot of good stories. So uh, I, I, when we're doing these segments, I want to do it where we have a story time, I guess, story time with Sean, as far as just a, a story about a case, a situation, just something to give us hopefully some education. Just, I don't know. So okay. tell us a good story, Sean. Tell us a good story. All right, so I'm going to give you, a, uh, the audience, a, a great piece of advice, and then I'm going to tell a story where I think I made a mistake. Okay. So the best piece of advice I can give you is if you are pulled over and you have marijuana, do not try to swallow it. Because that class B minor amount of marijuana turns into a felony tampering with evidence. Mm. Do not try to destroy it. Do not try to swallow it. Kids okay. do that all the time. Oh, I can swallow this small bag of weed. It never works. The law enforcement pulls that out of your mouth or you choke. Now you're charged with tampering with that evidence with a felony mm. rather than just a minor possession of marijuana that you could have taken a class and got it dismissed. Okay. So don't ever try to destroy it or swallow it. It's going to end poorly for you. Great advice. Yes. Secondly, I tried a possession of marijuana case, I don't know, three or four years ago. And a, one of the tricks we often use is when law enforcement seizes marijuana, they must be able to prove in court that that's the marijuana in court was, ex, was the marijuana they took from your pocket. And so a lot of times if law enforcement finds three or four bags of marijuana in a car, one's under the driver's seat, one's under the passenger seat, they have to be very, very careful that they label them correctly and when they come to court that they can say that bag was under the passenger seat because it's very hard to prove if you're the driver that you possess the passenger's weed under his seat mm. so if they can't say well this is the weed that was under the passenger seat i'm going to walk you on that because they can't prove you possess the amount that they have in court they must match the weed that they found to the weed that they are bringing to court to show the jury that it's marijuana got it so we had a guy who was found with marijuana and I start questioning the law enforcement officer and he brings a container that's sealed, labeled, marked with his signature, showing it wasn't tampered with. They open it, they pull out a, a, a small bag of weed. And I start questioning about the bag of weed and I'm like, well, can you identify anything on this bag? Well, no, I can't. You, don't, you didn't initial the bag that you found? Well, no. You didn't label it? No. So all you have is a Tupperware container that belonged to law enforcement that you put the weed in and you can't say this weed is the weed you found because you didn't initial this bag. Well, that's correct. I didn't have a good faith to s belief to say that that wasn't the weed. I know he didn't do what he was supposed to. He didn't label it correctly, but I had no evidence that it wasn't the weed. And so I didn't feel comfortable arguing that in closing that this wasn't the weed that, that they found in the car. Cause I'm essentially saying the officer tampered with evidence or planted evidence or mm. did something that effect. And I wasn't comfortable doing that. Okay. And they found my guy guilty and I went and talked to the jury and the jury's like, yeah, you admitted that that was marijuana that they found in the scene. We would have probably found him not guilty because he couldn't prove that was a marijuana that was found. Wow. 
And in hindsight, I'm like, I can't believe I did that. You know, I, and I struggle with that because I probably could have walked my guy had I made that argument, but ethically I wasn't real comfortable with it. And I've struggled with that. I have, I think about that often that I may have not done the very best I could have, but I think that was in a gray area that I wasn't willing to cross. Well, now you know. Yeah. I bet you won't let that happen again. I think I would probably argue it different. I still would be very careful with accusing a law enforcement officer of being unethical or, or incompetent without direct evidence of it. But it, 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 um, well, a question pops up from that story. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we're talking about bags of weed under the seats in cars. And if, you know, a car full of kids gets pulled over, everybody throws the weed under the seat, which always happens. Of course. Who gets pinned for it? Who goes to jail? Who's in trouble? Who's not? What's the outcome of a situation like that? Four people in a car, weed in the floorboard, in the back seat. No one claims it. Most of the time, law enforcement's going to arrest all four and let um, the court sort it out. The risk you run if law enforcement doesn't arrest everybody is everybody says it was the guy that wasn't arrested. I mean, that's what they're all going to say. Mm. So you have to show an affirmative link. You know, do they smell like marijuana? Do they admit to smoking marijuana? Where was it found? You know, can you prove the driver had possession of marijuana in the back passenger seat floorboard? Whose car was it? Um, how long have they been in the car? Um, again, do they admit to smoking marijuana earlier? You know, there's any number of things we look at. Uh, and they'll, they'll charge everybody. But by and large, we get the majority of those cases dismissed because in the end, they can't prove of an affirmative link to one specific person. So to give advice to a possible future client, if you're in the front seat with weed in your pocket, pull it out and throw it in the back. <laughs> pull it out of your pocket and throw it in the back seat and cross your fingers. My first piece of advice is, is don't smoke weed. I think there's, Just there's, a say lot no. of, there's a lot of risk associated with weed that people don't appreciate. Number one. Secondly, if you're getting pulled over, I probably wouldn't advise you start digging in your pockets. You're going to make a law enforcement officer really nervous. There you go. But the chances of me walking you on a case with the weed in your, in the back seat is much greater than if it's in your front pocket. Let me say that. So, you know, if, if, if you can safely get it out of your front pocket, I would highly advise that you do that. Good to know. Yeah, that's real good. But yes, just say no kids. That's it. Say no. (laughs) Well, this has been good. Well, good. Thanks for having me. Um, so our next show that we're wanting to do is, I think, a show that'll give a lot of great information. It's the one I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I think it's going to be answer a lot of questions that people have, especially here in the state of Texas, and that's gun laws, gun possession, gun ownership, LTC, non-LTC, carry. I mean, just the gamut as far as what we're going to do. So that's going to be our next show. And, and I say that because we want people who are watching this on Facebook, YouTube, wherever you're watching it, if you have a question in relation to what that show is going to be about, put it in the comments, send it to us, Jay Weiss Marketing. Um, Let us know what questions you have, things that you would like for us to ask Sean, because uh, we like to think that we ask really good questions, but uh, people out there may be thinking of something that we aren't thinking of. Absolutely. I mean, I own a firearm business, as you know, and I still have questions. Uh, you know, we take the classes, the LTC classes, you take the renewals, uh, but you know, it gets foggy after four or five or 10 years. So uh, there's, you know, owning my own firearm business that you've been to, it's, yes. it's important. And I've got questions that I want to ask to yeah, give we'll, myself answers, to give the audience answers right. and, and to know exactly what to do, what not to do. And, uh, yeah, we'll get into a lot of self-defense issues too, that we'll, we'll try to run through a lot of circumstances and what the law says, what you can and can't do. And. How to keep yourself out of keep yourself out of trouble? Real cool. So, as, as Grant was saying to the audience, if you have any questions related to gun laws, uh, whatever that might be, leave a comment on any platform that you can reach us at. You can feel free to send direct messages, text me if you got my number. Uh, but leave some comments, ask some questions, and we will be sure to answer all of them in our next show. Most definitely, absolutely. Well, Sean, again, man, this is uh, this is great. It's been a pleasure. I, yeah, well, good. I enjoy I, it. I really is, do. This is Thanks, this is Grant. stuff that Thanks, people John. need to know, and because it, like like we started the show off, people just don't know, and this is you got good information. Well, so. let's go ahead and have a beer and tell us a couple more stories. That's right. <laughs> right. Tell us something we can't get on. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Thanks. All right. All right. Take care, guys. guys. Yep.